Hello, everybody. This is Martin Coupled, and I've got Norman Guyver, B Genius, joining me <laughs> for the sixth episode of the Daily Pest Academy podcast. So, Norman, we were talking before this, and you were saying how difficult it, it was to get your app on the on the iOS platform on Apple. Yeah, various apps. Apple uh, have a whole squad of people that vet your apps. And they're, some of them, I don't know where they're based, but a lot of them are in California. And they seem to think that California is the center of the world. And everything that happens in California is how it happens in the rest of the world. And when we introduced the B-Watch app, they said, oh, no, 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 you can't have that name. So on, on Google, Android, it's called B-Watch. And on Apple, it's called Honey Bee Watch. You know, <laughs> and, and you think, oh, okay. But then we came up with another app where um, it's for rural crime. And most rural crimes uh, of the non-serious nature are, are based on guys going out in vehicles to see what they can steal and then going back later and stealing to order. And they decided that we had to have the local police to approve our app before they would put it up on their website. And I said, well, you know, in this country, everybody uses WhatsApp and which is all very good when they're rather than bits of paper and phone calls. But the trouble with WhatsApp is you don't record the data and the data is so valuable and, and it's not being recorded and not being looked back because it's all done manually. Mm. And they said, oh, no, no, no. There's only one or two people use WhatsApp. Yeah. I said, no, I'm sorry. I said that England is the sixth most densely populated country in the world. In Acton, where I, near where I used to live, there are 60 WhatsApp groups. And we went round in circles. And believe it or not, we changed the name of the app, resubmitted it, and a different group passed it. Really? <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's political, though, isn't it, with Apple yeah. and WhatsApp? Have you heard all of this? That Tim Apple no. had a, re a really good, a really good poke at Facebook, and he, he was saying how if you're um, if you're providing a service and it's in recompense, you're asking people to give up your, your privacy, then you're not providing a service at all. And when somebody as big as Tim Cook says that, he's he's <laughs> going after them. He's properly going after them. I wouldn't be surprised if Facebook just gets removed from the App Store at some point. Um, <laughs> So they appear to be at loggerheads. Things are boiling up there. So I think you've, you've stumbled into some Silicon <laughs> yes. Valley politics there. <laughs> well, it's also, I mean, in this country, the government are investigating Apple and they're also in Australia doing the same thing by just, by believing that everybody must operate the way you do in California, mm. you know, and, and, and it's a reality check for them. And they were very helpful. They rang me up about three or four times trying to find a way around the problem. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, the problem is only with, with where you are it's not a problem here you know but anyway mm. so yes it's just developing software you know not only have you got to write the stuff you then you go it, literally it was three and a half weeks and then we just decided to rename it and and a different group decided there was no problem let it through and all it was was recording people's car registration numbers so you see a car at the end of you know parked out in the street at the end of your driveway and you think well what's that doing there Mm. You just go on the app. This is our you watch app. You simply take a picture of it. It grabs the registration number and stores it. Then two mm -hmm. weeks later, when there's a local theft, you can say, hold on, there was a suspicious vehicle hanging around a couple of weeks ago. And what people don't realize is how well organized crime is organized. Mm. You know, it's a pucker, fully developed retail business. Mm. And the business starts with people looking for product to sell which is basically your cat or dog or whatever <laughs> that bit of kit in your driveway those saddle stones you know by your flower whatever it is they go looking for a customer so that they might advertise it locally or they mm. might advertise it within their own network somebody says i'll have that they go steal it and deliver it mm. job done Crazy. never in their possession long enough to their ever for them to hold incriminating evidence but it all starts in 90 whatever percent of cases with somebody driving around quite happily checking out what's available mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and there are there are serious sides to it which is a theft of batteries mm. they steal the batteries for the acid 
Oh, I thought it was for the lead for recycling. Oh, the lead's a bonus. Oh, okay. Um, and and the acid's for opening container doors and things, is it? No, no, for oh, making crystal making crystal meth. <laughs> ah! You can't buy acid in bulk anymore. I wondered why my nose was tingling so much these days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <You. laughs> well, I haven't had that experience yet. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the whole uh, battery acid, even citric acid, you can't buy it in bulk. You know, but the advantage of the more powerful acids is they don't need as much. So all over okay. the country, people will have heard uh, up in Norfolk, two golf courses had their buggy batteries stolen, mm. right? Barnum Broom, and I can't remember the name of the other one, but the golf course in between did not have theirs stolen. Mm. And basically the routine happens all over the country that the thieves will go in, check out where your buggies are. They'll come in overnight. They'll drive the buggies to the back entrance to the golf course and empty out the batteries. Mm. And if the police turn up at the front, they drive away. Mm. And it happened to the golf course that are across from us, the Springs, and they just parked up on the Thames path, drove the buggies to it. The police turn up, where are the buggies? Somewhere on the golf course. You know, mm. and there was a guy in Norfolk. I did a crime prevention seminar with the Norfolk police. And this guy about six foot six came up. He said, somebody's stolen all the batteries of all my electric boats. Mm. So I said, well, they've stolen them. He said, they're only worth 30 pounds. I said, no, 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 no. I said, the acid in them's worth a lot. And he, what do you mean the acid is worth a lot? I said, well, that's what they do with it, make crystal meth. So he disappeared and he came back with three police officers and he said to me, tell these guys the story. Mm. And, I, and I explained to them and they didn't even know. Wow, okay. You know, because the police, there are 43 police authorities in the UK, across England and Wales, mm. there's one in Scotland. The Scots really? are way ahead. It's a single police authority for the all of Scotland. There was a lot of chat about combining them a few years uh, ago. Why, yeah. why hasn't this happened then? Because it appears that the, the sharing of information is one of our public services' great downfalls. It's just people oh. don't bloody talk to each other. Well, have you heard of the 101 non-serious crime report number? 101, yeah. you ring 101. Yeah. 101 was introduced before the smartphone ever existed. Mm. And the right. government are still investing in 101, right? Um, last year, 101 took 30 million phone calls at three pounds a piece. Each phone call took 20 minutes on average, and somebody had to type that into a computer to get it into the database of information. So we developed an app called 102 <laughs> using the smartphone. Yeah. Right. So with the suspicious vehicle, you can go up to the vehicle, take a picture. It grabs the reg number out of the picture. And if you press send, it would arrive at a local police officer's phone with the picture in five seconds. Hmm. Right. We've written to everybody. We've written to the uh, Kit Malthouse, the top um, MP for policing. It would save them 80 million pounds a year in taking phone calls and nobody is interested. Mm. But what it would do, you'd have this massive database of cross national information on vehicles turning up here, stuff goes missing and they appear somewhere else. You know, you've got all that information that's not being collected, but fundamentally on 101, you can't even add a picture. Mm. So, it seems like it would take a lot of the burden off as well, getting the end user to be providing all of the information themselves in, in, you know, a data capture form. It makes much more sense. But I can hear, I can hear local politicians saying, oh, well, what about, you know, people that don't have smartphones? What about people that, I, I don't know, that can't use them quickly enough? The, the most vulnerable, don't worry. No, don't worry about these people that have smartphones. Worry about the most vulnerable. And you can, you can hear them twittering away, can't you? Well, um, yeah, but the, the answer to that, Martin, is in the UK has always been the highest incidence of all technology. We believe we have to be way ahead, which we are. 83% of all people in this country, all people own a smartphone. Mm. so the, the, you know go back five years and your your comment was valid it's not valid anymore 
Mm. You know, and yet the police still do not use the smartphone that you and I have in our pockets. I how many of those you know. 17% are the flip phone weirdos. Have you come across them yet? No, not yet. <laughs> the people that think they're being tracked by the government. <laughs> so they have to get a flip phone to, so that you know, oh, nothing, right. nothing's being monitored on their phone. Anyway, yeah, well, well, I, I digress. So your, your, core, your core business is developing apps. Where did the bees come in? Well, interestingly, we started off... Uh, I had a previous business. We, we um, invented the swipe card in 1983 and we stuck a barcode for health clubs. So it was a quick way of knowing that you've been into a health club. Okay. And that's where we started. So basically managing people. Mm -hmm. um, we sold it in 1999 and I retired, but you don't retire. And I live in a rural area and we had rats on our compost heap. So I was talking to a buddy of mine, mine and said, listen, can we get a message, a text sent to our phone if there's a rat in the rat trap. So he developed this little bit of a system, but the technology wasn't really there. You know, phone coverage wasn't brilliant and so on. So we shelved it and forgot about it for about um, nine years. And then we revisited it. And he said, well, you've got new technology now. You've got, uh, you've got the GPRS level of data transfer on mobile phones all working now. There was ways to get messages, small amounts of data around a lot quicker. So we started looking at that. But what we realized at the same time was the technical challenge for knowing a rat is in a trap is the same technical challenge for knowing a thief is in your shed. OK, yeah. So we suddenly realized, actually, if we developed something for rats and we made it generic, it would also work for petty crime. And basically, knowing that something is happening in a place that might be miles away because you can communicate via the mobile phone. And of course, wow. by 2011, when we started this, um, the smartphone had been invented. So all of the challenges of the phone actually being a data capture device were being overcome. Hmm. So we got into two sides of the business, believe it or not, the back end management system is names and addresses. And it's the same for both the beekeeping side and for the the uh, security side wow. right. okay you just so, yeah, okay so you, the, you're catching smaller rats and bigger rats i had to get that joke <laughs> i had to get that joke in there somewhere just before we move on to bees so <laughs> well just on the rats on. one as well um the, the key which all your guys will know is you've got to break the breeding cycle it's no good catching one rat and then catching another one a week later because they bred 10 more in the meantime so it's the ability to empty the trap quickly, get it set again so that you catch the next one before it has time to breathe. You know, it's that, that is the name of the game. And it's the same with thieves. Mm. You've got to take them out of the equation completely to stop the problem. Otherwise they breed, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and dare I say it with organized crime, the guy's next door is the guy, you know, he's selling stolen goods or whatever. And he's just your next door neighbor. It's that well organized. Mm. So anyway, the bees came about because um, we keep, I've kept bees now, I'm in my 13th year, so I'm not a long-standing beekeeper, but we have a nice big garden, a bit of a field and a stream, so it seemed like a good idea. And Richard Rouse, um, of Rouse's Honey, who's now retired, he used to keep bees here. So I put my hives in the same place. <laughs> he must know what he was doing. He might, he might know a thing or two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but what we found, I mean, if you go back to when I first started, we were catching... 15, 20, 25 swarms a year mm. in our area, which is South Oxfordshire. And we're, we were then surrounded by mixed farms with cattle, pigs, um, you know, arable and so on. Um, in the past 12, 11, 12 years, the past two and a half years now, we've never seen a bee swarm. Mm. And all the farms are now 100% arable. Yeah. You know, it's a three crop rotation um and it's not an environment in which you can successfully keep bees anymore um and it all comes down to the autumn harvest 90 percent of the land that's arable has no forage for any insect on it whatsoever once it's been harvested it's just a empty field mm. you know and it's the same it's not just arable if you go over to ireland the massive problem in ireland is massive agricultural product is grass 
Mm. And grass is of no benefit to bees either. So you've got this massive uh, milk and, and beef industry that's turning more and more fields over to mass production of grass, which has no environmental benefit whatsoever. You know, this is why you say, uh, uh, um, sorry to interrupt, but, but <laughs> it, 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 was, it raised my eyebrows a few years ago when I heard of this chap in Hackney, I think, with beehives on the balcony of his tower block. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, hey, he's a bloody idiot having urban honey. And then I listened to you, mm -hmm. unassailable sage of the bees, um, and you say that now it, it, that we're in this situation with um, uh, agriculture becoming much more of a monoculture and this mm -hmm. obsession with neatness and input, mm. you, you actually have better honey coming from urban areas than you do from rural areas. Yeah, no, at, well, at certain times, yeah, I think there's, there's two, two added factors. One is climate change, which is very significant. And, and, and it's very significant because it's happening so quickly. And the second one is seasons. So um, when, when we started to get seriously looking at the pesticides issues, um, the, the, the primary one in our area that, that is massively used is the number one in the whole world, which is Roundup, the weed killer, glyphosate. Okay. It's a very important and a very valuable product. It's the best weed killer. And when you've got a weed problem, you know, you wouldn't look at anything else if you want a long-term solution. So you have to understand that in the whole gambit of pesticides, there are very, very beneficial ones. And glyphosate is a very beneficial one when it's used um, uh, correctly is not the phrase, but when it's used when it should be and not misused for other things. And I think that's uh, that combined with, with um, climate change is where Three years ago, two, two winters ago, over the winter, um, we lost 31 out of 44 colonies. Now, if you've ever seen a beekeeper <laughs> working away around his beehives, just to manage 44 colonies is a huge um, labour of love all throughout the year. And then just to see them die out, it's actually... Uh, affects you more than just in a you know a nuisance value it's an emotional value as well and the guy that i was working with at the time now he stopped keeping bees mm. he got literally depressed with the whole thing but um you can either give up which which and he's done also because he's got four children so he's been an educator for the past year so you know he, he had other things to do but if you then start to look at what the issues are and try and get to the bottom of it, you try and understand, then maybe you can educate people on better ways to do things. And we started off by reporting our losses to the appropriate authorities, which are basically the National Bee Unit, which is part of DEFRA, Natural England, who are supposed to be looking after the environment. And then when we got test results, <laughs> Uh, sorry, <laughs> people can't see the smiling on the on the, <laughs> on the, on the podcast. Or, but anyway, um, yeah, and, and um, uh, the, the HSE, who should be looking at serious issues, uh, environmental issues, um, then, then we started to realise that things were not uh, in a good place. Um, that uh, this, hang, hang on a minute. But these, yeah. these, these bees were dying out because of starvation? No, no, I'll, 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 they, they were dying out. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give you the, 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 the uh, understanding that we have. Mm. Firstly, what does glyphosate do? It, it is not an insecticide. Mm. Glyphosate is put out there prior to drilling in new crops um, to kill what is known as pre-emergent weeds, weeds that come up before the crop has come up. Now that is a perfectly good use and it tends to happen in the spring when the bees are just coming out of, um, not they don't hibernate, but they're just coming out of their uh, a winter um, break. And there's plenty of crocuses, and there's plenty of ivy around, which all gives honey. So for the bees, it's fine. Then you come to the summer where some of the winter crops are harvested and re-drilled again, there's all the hedgerows, there's all the trees, very important for bees. 
Then you get to the autumn when everything is harvested. But this is where we've now found the problem to be. It's how the harvesting is done. And you wouldn't have thought it was a complication. You go out and you put your combine in the field and you harvest. If you've got a field full of rape, the chances are, if it's a large field, some of it will be fully ripe and some won't. So you would have to harvest it, dry it, and then it's available for whatever you, whoever you're going to sell it to. However, if you can get it to dry while it's in the field, then you don't have to worry about having a dryer. So there's a thing in farming known as desiccation. Basically, the farmers will spray the field with glyphosate to kill the crop. <laughs> it all dries at the same time, so it's easy to harvest. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a misuse of that chemical. It's an unnecessary use. But what then happens is, at that time of year, that is the time of year when bees have least forage. One thing bees need is lots of water. You know, they're... They're out there buzzing, buzzing around the place. They'll travel five kilometers and they'll travel further and further to find the forage they want. And they'll pick up any water they can, droplets off of plant leaves and whatever. And they'll bring it back to the colony with the nectar they found and they will store it in the colony. So you've got glyphosate being picked up out at this time of year, being stored in the colony. But what does glyphosate actually do to the bees? It's a neurotoxin. Right. Now, and it's a neurotoxin for us as well. So just Ooh. in a different different quantity level. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Well, what you'll find is most pesticides are neurotoxins. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the ways some even of them the kill, kill the insects is by affecting their nervous system. Right. So where, where you get to now is we've got stores in the hives containing glyphosate. Now we needed to prove that. So we took samples from the 32, 31 hives that died out and we sent 10 of them off to be tested. And we sent them to an official laboratory, the same one that Rouse's Hunter use. Okay, three of those samples we took from honey that we harvested in July and seven of the samples were from honey taken out of the stores, the honey is still in the hive, of the hives that died out. All three of the honey samples taken in the summer contain zero glyphosate. All seven of the samples collected from hives that died out contained up to 560 times the legal food limit of glyphosate. Good Lord. Right. So how does it kill the bees? <laughs> what are we getting with climate change? And this is where the two come together. We have a nice, uh, if you go back two years, Boxing Day was bright and sunny, our bees were flying. They've been eating glyphosate stores happily in the hive when it's cold. They go off flying. The temperature drops in the afternoon. They can't find their way home. They die out in the field. So the symptoms are, you go down to the apiary, there's a colony there full of bees happily buzzing away. You go back three or four days later after a warm spell when the temperature's dropped, you open up the hive, it's empty. Okay. Right. Now so this... What's, what's happened? Right. Well, what's happened is what is, everybody has known to happen in America is called colony collapse disorder. Mm -hmm. Basically... The bees appear to abscond. Right, as you well people know. tried to work this out for some time, what the hell was going on. And some people were pointing at varroa mites. Some people were pointing at some sort of bacteria or virus. Some people were pointing at the, dare I say it, the neonicotinoids. So what, what are you, where, where is this going with glyphosate? Right, well, the key is, um, I said the key is, Having made those observations and had those tests done, and they, those tests cost us over a thousand pounds, and we're just beekeepers. Mm -hmm. We decided as a business then, we needed to start linking up with farmers, and we produced a version of apps that the farmers can tell us what they're spraying, right? 
And they did this willingly because, believe it or not, the farmers are as concerned as anybody, but they're under pressure to produce as much food as possible and by yeah. whatever means, yeah. you know. So, so, you know, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody here, but you're aware that last year um, there were three major court cases in the United States about glyphosate causing cancer. Mm -hmm. And they and Monsanto, aka their new owners, were mm -hmm. um, uh, found guilty in all three cases. Really, I didn't know that. Yeah, and, and I didn't also, know it was only three as well. I thought there were no, many no, more. No, 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 no. Then, as a result of the evidence that came out that Monsanto knew about the issues, forty-six thousand more cases. Oh. <laughs> Right, America. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And and when you then go to the academics in the United States and you ask them what is the effect on bees, it's colony collapse disorder. Really, right. So they've known all along, prior to these court cases. Um, you you probably aware Bayer? How much do you know? How much Bayer actually paid out? Not a clue. No. They paid out twice what BP pay, paid out over the uh, oil spill in the Bay of Mexico. Deep, deep horizon, yeah. Okay. Eight billion pounds. Huh. <laughs> but, but it still baffles me. Who would buy that company? Who would buy that company? But anyway, they're much well, cleverer than well, me. Let's not go there. No, no, but it's the largest. It, it's a very good, important chemical if used correctly. Yeah, so Monsanto has... has value it's a very decent chemical it, it it was exclusively to monsanto as well so there's still yeah. a, a residual business there but what you're saying is it, this is glyphosate being used incorrectly misused and that and that's what that is what um well you say misuse but that 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 implies a certain amount of um intention if you know what i mean yeah no absolutely absolutely and here's the interesting thing if you take the concept of desiccation i.e. getting rid of a problem that stops your harvesting, mm. we come on to the potato. Okay, yeah. yeah. The potato... I, the, now, I thought the, they used acid for this rather than... <laughs> right. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, well, um, uh, some, uh, some news, if you want to call it that, coming out of a Welsh university is a thousand times the legal food limit of glyphosate in potatoes. Jesus. Right. I, okay. Right. I, I genuinely thought they used natural acids for this to spray off well, the potato. Well, put it like this. You've got glyphosate in the cupboard and to kill the hallum on the top, which is very stringy stuff if you've ever hand dug potatoes. Yeah. If you can get rid of that, it makes your harvesting simpler again. Okay. Yeah. So basically, and, and I'll give you the phrase because... We, we, we did a circulation to all the local farmers telling us about the problems we'd had. And I had five phone calls from farmers and they all agreed they misused glyphosate. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but they're, you know, it's, we're being forced to use it because we haven't to produce as much as possible. So the whole, the whole potato thing, simplifying harvesting, you know what the farmers call glyphosate? Liquid oh. sunshine. Oh, lovely. Right on. Okay. You know, it's just so, you know, it is well known amongst all the farming community that we will use glyphosate for desiccation because it's like perfect sunshine. You know, just... okay. So there's, there's a couple of problems here. And not, I mean, this is, this is meant to be a pest control podcast. Thank God we're talking <laughs> about bees. But um, just to not to get too deep into agronomy here, but. Um, with the uh, with the potatoes, there's there's one problem here that the majority of the potatoes grown for the supermarkets in this country are done by contractors. It's not being done on their land, and they're you know they are paying to use somebody mm -hmm. else's field, and they have all of this machinery which they can use across multiple farms because the machinery is bloody expensive. Um, so I can see that the intent, not the intention, is there that the uh, that the the temptation is there. They, they don't have a vested interest in, in this land at all. They, you know, they're there to make money. That is a, a business, a good business. So yeah, anything that is going to help them. 
cut margins is going to is that's going to be in their best interest. And then the other problem with oilseed rape is is because it ripens at different times. Normally, that's you know it's not a massive problem for um, for farmers. You know, you you wait a bit longer and the seed clings on there. But but with oilseed rape, you've got um, if you don't all ripen at the same time, then the ones that come on later, as they're starting to turn, so they're ready to be harvested, the um, the oilseed rape is it, it's sort of like in a pea pod, and yeah. and that splits open in the sun, and then just you know you've got money falling down onto the ground, uh, left, right, and centre. So people did do. Um, there was a, it was when I was maybe eighteen or nineteen. There was this this sort of copy dex glue type stuff yeah. called pod stick that they would spray on to keep the pods together so that you wouldn't have to spray, spray it off. You know, we call it around here mm -hmm. spraying it off. Um, and, but that, I, whether that didn't work or something, you, you just never heard, heard about it again. Um, yeah. Well, I, th I think, I think, I think these don't underestimate the contractors knowledge. I mean, these guys, I've had a long conversation with a beekeeper in Grantham whose husband is a, is a contract farmer. And the knowledge they have about how you manage your contracts, mm. little things like add a bit of weed killer to a fungicide and it acts like a really, really good insecticide. Oh, Jesus Christ. You know, and, and this is, you know, we're, I'm asking questions saying, we found this, this, and this is, oh yeah, 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 yeah. If you add a bit of weed killer to, to a fungicide, it's a brilliant insecticide. You know, and you, you think, hold on, we thought we discovered this. This is all fully understood. But if you come to the crunch point, and we should get on to, on to pest control and bees. <laughs> um, if you come to the crunch point, it's this. With all what's been going on with glyphosate in the United States, what is the situation in this country? It causes cancer. It, we are one of the densest users of it because of the density of our population. There is a, uh, um, a DEFRA scheme called WIS, the Wildlife Incident Investigation Service. Mm -hmm. So when we had our problems, we called, called out Natural England, who was supposed to investigate. Um, they turned up, wandered around, and decided that they couldn't see a problem. Mm -hmm. They sent two pretty girls down who knew nothing about bees with a questionnaire. They didn't take any samples of honey away. They didn't take any water to test the way in case to find out how anything was getting in. In the meantime, we had the honey tested and we got the results back from, from that testing. So we notified the HSE. The HSE sent out the National Bee Unit to take samples of the honey and they found the glyphosate that we found four months later, mm -hmm. right? If you go on to the whiz database for the past 10 years, I think it is, which is an Excel spreadsheet on the WIS website, and you type in the word glyphosate, for the past 10 years, it's the most widely used pesticide in the world. It does not appear once mm. on the whole database. I got an email back from the top man at the HSE to say, the samples of honey we've taken from your hives there may be a delay in getting them tested because we don't have a test for glyphosate. Oh. Now this is FERA. Hmm. FERA is the only government testing agency and they never ever test for glyphosate. And yet in the United States, they have just paid out 8 billion. That's, yeah, that is that is odd, isn't it? FERA is, um, <laughs> is, is very, food based and as i understand it it's now around about 70 percent privately owned absolutely so, yeah okay so there, there there might be an inclination <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm stopping that sentence before it no starts. no absolutely <laughs> no, you know but at the end of the day there are better ways to use these chemicals yeah you know um the problem in our area is all of a sudden you know 50 percent of all the fields are oilseed rape Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that, what that has done is wiped out all the feral colonies which produce the swarms. Yeah. You know, so I mean, we have virtually virtually no varroa in our apiary, 
because there's no apiaries near us with bees that have got Varroa to give it to us. Mm -hmm. You can get rid of Varroa, yeah. mm -hmm. you know. But but again, I mean, um, so so where do you want to go from here? Do we go on well, the bees? I, I think the, the the real key thing with this, when somebody's got big news and, you know, it, it's a significant enough worry, the only, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. That, that's mm -hmm. the thing. I mean, glyphosate has always been seen as a very benign chemical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, people um, buy it in the shed loads. I mean, you, you know, you can buy it as an amateur, you can buy it as a, as a farmer and you can, you can spray it pretty much where you want, so long as it's not near water and not on a windy day. It's, and that's, that's, that's the, that's the um, as much of the restrictions as you really need. Um, but if, if there's this big worry is confirmed and worried about that, but worried about by enough people, then, then, then you become the, the news becomes the necessity that creates yeah. the invention. And there must be, it can't be beyond the wit of man <laughs> to find some, um, some solution to the, you know, the, the ripening at different times in yeah. oil seed rape. And let's, let's not forget as well, I mean, and I know it's extremely different year on year, but the price of oil seed rape globally has absolutely shot through the roof. I mean, it got hit during Corona because of the lack of, um, uh, you know, commercial oils being used in restaurants and whatnot. But since um, uh, since the beginning of the year, the price has absolutely rocketed up. There should be some really good profit in it, mm -hmm. which means that the 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 inclination to cutting margins, it would be a lot easier to remove that. So we, you know, we've got ripe conditions here. <laughs> boom, boom, um, to be able to. Um, push for a change but yeah. it, it's it's how um how solid you can get the science before you start before yeah. you start talking <clears throat> about this yeah um, there you go that that is that is it and when when the control of the science in this country is in the hands of a lot of, of the agrochemical industry then you get the answers that the industry wants so yeah this this is the know. thing that sucks is if you if you want a, an experiment done which is you know bulletproof then it's going to yeah. cost you millions of pounds and yeah. and there's not a lot of people that are going to pay millions of pounds to get you to stop doing something yes there's a lot of people that will pay millions of pounds to get you to start doing something it's a, especially if it involves some sort of commercial transaction at the end of it but yeah. this is where, you, you know, there's, there's all sorts of um, uh, difficulties over um, uh, neonicotinoids and the science around that. The, the thing that did that was public outcry, completely against the grain of what, what the science was saying. Um, and so the, are you saying that the public outcry is, would be, would be the, the more effective route forward? No, no, not at all. In fact, um, what you've just explained to me there is that, um, dare I say it, you've been sucked in with everybody else. Ah, no. <laughs> we can't get even more controversial on here, Norman. Let's go. Come no, on. Martin, no, it's dead simple. Um, right. Uh, neonicotinoids occur in all sorts of places. There are neonicotinoids that were available for farmers, and there were neonicotinoids that were so dangerous that farmers were not allowed to use them. Oh, okay. Right, and there's one called fipronil. Yeah, okay, oh yeah. Have you heard of it? Very familiar with that from, um, well, what is fipronil in? It's in ant bait, but because of the ant biology, you use a microscopic amount of it. You know, you get them to well, take a gut, gut load and take it back to the yeah. mess. But then if, 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 they spray yeah, it everywhere you, well, in Europe, don't they? No, well, they may do, I don't know. But it is used en masse in this country, and it is a serious neurotoxin. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, have you did you hear the news or the promotion recently? Don't let your dog swim in a river. No. No. Oh, right. Okay. There was a news article saying you shouldn't you let your dog swim in a river if you've just given it its flea treatment. Oh, because it's already got organophosphates on it. It's already got fipronil oh. on the back of its neck. Really. Right. So you might be overdosing your dog if there's... No, 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 no. You're overdosing yourself. Where do you stroke your dog? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Norman. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, seriously, 
Where do you stroke your dog? <laughs> yeah, on the back of, of its on, neck, on the back of its, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you go and wash your hands after every time you stroke your dog? No, of course not. Rub my face uh, all over it, wrestle with it, <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, and your cat. Yeah, right. right. I don't have a cat. Okay. Yeah, that's another story. When I was talking to Martin Bell at the HSE, we were talking about Clive. He said, so tell me about Fipronil. I said, what do you mean tell you about Fipronil? He said, it's appearing everywhere. Mm. Right. And, and this is just an aside. My daughter took our cat about six months ago to the local vet to have a tick removed from its eyelid. It cost £80 and she came back with a whole 12 month treat, uh, flea treatment packet, which was £60. We didn't ask for it. The veterinary industry is flooding the domestic pet marketplace with fipronil. Right. right. Now, when I was a kid, I knew somebody who had asthma. I never knew a kid that was depressed. I never knew a kid that, you know, had any of them what we call the 21st century diseases. Right. And I didn't know too many people of now my age who had dementia. Mm hmm. Which two groups spend most of their time stroking pets? Mm. Right. And you can do a very simple gross error check. And I did one, you know, the number of people that own pets, blah, blah, blah. If you stroke your pet five times between treatments, it, it extrapolates as 11 million doses of fipronil a week into the population of this country. <laughs> you know, this is the trouble you've got. That whole thing about beetroot and everything, at the same time that's happening, you watch the television at adverts for Broadline and Frontline, they're on all the time. You mm. know, treat your animal for fleas. And what's in there? Fipronil. Because there, there was a huge outcry when there was the Fipronil egg scandal with imported there eggs. There was probably something to do with Brexit and people being a little bit anti-European <laughs> at the time. But hey, ho. Um, but that, that was, again, a massive public outcry. And that was front page news um where is the front page news of this don't okay when when people are starting to say don't let your pets in the river that's that's kind of scary that's well, you know it, you're you're getting into olden days the fish floating up i'll, I'll never forget the no, day it's I the went aquatic the insects river and, it's and the aquatic the, insects right okay that's what you're killing because yeah. the trouble with fibronil and a lot of neonics is they don't break down so they get concentrated in the rivers when it rains, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. So yeah, the so the whole thing with with what was it, sugar beet or what was it? I can't remember what it was. You know, it was a great story that distracted people from the mass use of fipronil, which is in fleet treatments. Right. Yeah. Which is just being mass used in a in a much in a yeah, different in way an environment by a, a lot more people in smaller smaller measures. Yeah. Okay. And, I see and, what you mean. Unfortunately, anally, I read the whole set of instructions for a packet of Broadline. <laughs> and there's one line that says, we advise you don't sleep with your pets having treated it. Oh, good Lord, come on. And if you are pregnant, you should be careful. Yeah. And that, that was the total in 3,000 words of warning. And yet they tell you to put it on the dog to stop the dog getting it in their mouth, exactly where you would stroke the dog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. They don't so we'll, say... we'll, we'll come on to the dimension depression bit in a bit <laughs> <laughs> because that that was that was a very loose connection that i might just have to put you up on i'll agree with you first but then i'll, I'll, I'll have to put you up on it right. uh, with, with um with pest control we are so careful so careful of putting these things in people's houses so careful and it's all yeah. image that's all it is because if you look at the um the ld50 from some um i don't know fairy liquid and you compare it to the LD50 of the now sadly banned Fendona 6SC. Mm. I mean, you have to sort of glug, glug, glug it back for <laughs> Fendona to have any effect on, on a human whatsoever, whereas very liquid <laughs> is bloody toxic. Um, so it, it's the point I'm trying to make is when people are using a well a well-known brand which has the perceived intention of good in mm. their house, yeah. that's fine. But when somebody has something foreign coming into the house for the perceived intention of bad, yeah, yeah. it's you know you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah. It's 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 good that we're killing the pest, but it's we are killing things. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That all of all of a sudden becomes the perceived danger in the room, 
when it's the when the real danger was in the room to start with yes. it's, it, it's very discouraging that all of the efforts that pest control makes especially around bees and especially around putting pesticides in people's homes that there's there's no cause for concern there whatsoever that it's it's really it's Mm -hmm. stuff that is being marketed to people that is readily Absolutely. available and being applied broad brush uh, yeah i've always I've, i said it at the um uh, recent webinar i've always found the bpca or the, the pesticide industry to be so aware uh which is always why i then queried why so few of them actually collect bees <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when you're so aware of the environment and the bee is such an indicated species, why do you ignore it? You know, mm. and I was in fact talking to a local pest controller yesterday whose business now, he said, listen, I've got to employ somebody. I'm getting so much business. He says, I've got swarms to cut out from buildings because the media has created this importance of the bee and people are now not wanting to just poison them and, and get rid of the problem. They're wanting to do something. I'm doing mm -hmm. one at the moment where an apple tree fell over and it's got a bee colony in it. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to extract the bee colony. So we've chainsawed off one of the branches that opens up the colony, screwed a hive on the end, because the people mm -hmm. want us to do it. Mm -hmm. Whereas you go back five years, it would be, oh, don't worry about that. Get we're going to burn the tree, you know, or whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. so you've got this, you know, you couldn't pay for the public awareness for, for pollinators and bees now. Mm. And what this pest control also told me was, he said, I've got beehives in the end of my garden now. You're going to like this, Martin. Mm. <laughs> this is how he's nurturing his business. He said, I've got beehives in the end of my garden. I put the swarms in there and the following year, they outgrow the hive and swarm. They go in people's roofs and I go and collect them. <laughs> <laughs> Hello again, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. What putting, those, putting those swarms back into the you know trees and whatever what we call feral colonies mm. is what you know is what we've lost here. But I I do think just to conclude on all that that the combination of glyphosate and the winter two years ago when it rained so much and everything was left very late mm. and then a warm you know spring before the before the last bit which was the beast from the east yeah you know which everybody blamed for their losses i mean i, I just love it this arbitrary way we we account for for what goes on and then we move on and don't really learn from it well it's what can be seen versus the yeah, that's really, absolutely right yeah. Yeah yeah, yeah 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 and that's there's something very primal about that i can understand that yeah um but yeah but i think the move is... the move into bees though is just such a co good commercial uh, um, opportunity. I mean, in our area, I said uh, on the on the webinar, if anybody's got any swarms they don't want, I'll buy them off you. Mm. Because we, the only way to replenish your colony with uh, genetic diversity is not breeding your own queens and using your own queens all the time, mm. especially if you're in an area where there's not a lot of other bee colonies. Uh, so you I haven't know. considered inbreeding in bees because, well, it, it, you know, I'm a stored product insects guy, you know, I, I <laughs> kill bugs in food. They don't seem to have a problem with this, with this, with this genetic bottleneck. But if you've got something as long living as bees, then I suppose if this guy's bringing back his swarms to the same hive, then he's going to have some inbreeding going on there. Well, uh, yes, I mean, a queen will, will breed with up to 20 drones. You know, okay. it always amuses me in the beekeeping industry when somebody says, well, I've got buckfast bees. And I go, oh, right. OK, so when the queen is on heat, if we put it like that, you only allow her to mate with one drone, do you? you know, <laughs> you've got no choice. They go five kilometres to what's called a drone congregation area. And all the local drones get together and they hammer these queens. So the queen's got a mixture of up to say 20 different genuses of sperm which he hangs on to for four years i was going to say is they they store the semen for a ridiculously long time right? yeah up That's to amazing. four years the life of a queen but the other the other interest i always like the tidbits on this um the other interesting thing is every drone um every new drone like at this time of year now we've got uh lots of drones in the hives getting ready because the swarming season is starting. Um, none of them have a father. Okay. 
Because when the queen lays an egg, if she fertilizes it, it becomes female. Oh, okay, yeah. And if she doesn't... Nature's default. Yeah. And if she doesn't, it's a male, which means it was her father that created the male. She's changed it by fertilizing it. So a, a male bee only has a grandfather, no father. Oh, can you do that again? That's, that's made me go cross-eyed. No, absolutely. Right, the queen, if she lays an egg, it's male. Right, okay. I got that the wrong way around. But so if she fertilises it, it, it's female. It becomes a female. Oh, that's backwards <laughs> from a lot of species. Because all, <laughs> all male humans start off as female. That's the, that's the thing. Well, if, they, if they don't get that blast of testosterone, then. Yeah. And they don't, they don't, they don't grow their testes. So, but with you're saying with bees, it's the other way around. That so yeah. all eggs are female unless she, unless the the queen bee decides to spit a bit of semen into it. No, no, but no, they're all male. They're all, they're all male. male. Oh, so, they're okay. all male. They're it's all the male. They're all male. And then Got she them. she sticks a bit of semen. They become female. So most of the year, ninety nine percent of the bees in a hive are female. Right. The second thing is, is so when does she lay a queen? Presumably right at the end of the year. No, no, right, okay. She doesn't. The We've queen... been through this, Norman. I'm not a bee expert. <laughs> no, but, but this is all you need to know. <laughs> is um, the, the hive, the queen is called a queen by humans. As far oh. as the rest of the bees in the colony are concerned, she's an egg-laying machine. So she is the future of the colony. And it's the colony somehow, and nobody really knows, that decide if she's a good queen, a bad queen, if they want to replace her, whatever. It's nothing to do with the queen. So the colony will decide various things. They could, they could um, say it's been a really good spring. We're absolutely packed out in this beehive. There's no room to expand anymore. We're going to make a new queen. And then the old queen will swarm and get rid of half the colony, right? Well, what that does, it procreates bee colonies, but the existing colony gets a brand new queen. And it's the old queen that leaves with something like half the bees. So that's what a swarm is. Okay. The reason, the reason, that makes evolutionary sense as well, because you've, you've yeah. got the, the vibrancy retained in the hive. Yes. And, and the older genetics, take your chances, love. That's I, it. Yeah, I get that. Absolutely. Okay. And that works. And bearing in mind that approximately half of the bees in a bee colony can't fly, the ones that stay are the youngest bees. Because when a bee, uh, when a, a pupa hatches, it becomes a nurse bee. So the ones that were nursing it then become workers in the hive and they eventually learn to fly and become foragers. Hmm. Right. So... What's left in the hive is the majority of nurse bees looking after the new bees waiting to hatch. What okay. the swarm, what the foragers that go off with the new, with the old queen, they need to set up a new colony. So they take loads of honey with them, which is why you can put your hand in a swarm and it won't sting you. Because they're smothered in honey? How do they're they carry They're absolutely full of honey. Right, okay. I bet but you could run... Inside them, or yeah, yeah, they store it inside them the same way as they do when they're when they're uh, transporting nectar. Okay. So for three or four days, they don't need to forage; they need to turn that honey into wax so the queen can start laying. This is bloody mind blowing. I love it. <laughs> so we we've already had bee orgies. We've just had a bit of bee usurpation. Uh, <laughs> regicide dare we say it um uh, or or exile yeah and how do they turn honey into wax that that sounds alchemical well they have got, they've got a gland that does it and it's an enzymatic thing yeah and it takes about six to seven units of honey to make one unit of wax right so it's just finishing the other bit though so the swarm has disappeared they found somewhere to live. But what, and this is important when you start thinking about pest controllers and, and bees. The queen will have been in the hive for a couple of years. She won't have flown for a couple of years. So what normally happens when a colony swarms is they leave 
let's say it's a hole in a tree or a beehive, and they'll land on the nearest tree, right? She gives off a pheromone, so they're all attracted round her. And if it's in the afternoon, you'll see something like a rugby ball hanging from a tree. That's a brand new swarm just left its colony somewhere locally. Mm -hmm. Right. If you want to catch it, get any old cardboard box you like, any sort of box, a bag, anything, put it under that and bang the branch with a stick and they'll all drop in the bag. Right? Right. And those that don't drop in the bag will be attracted by the queen's pheromone and mm. will go in the bag. All right, for, for pest controllers like me out there who have never done this before, what are the chances of you not getting the queen in that bag or box? Um, virtually zero, unless, as long as they're hanging in the tree. If, mm. if they're all over the face of a tree, mm. then you need to get a dustpan and brush and mm. brush them into their bag or whatever, or into your box, right? But the point is this, she gives off a pheromone and they all follow it. So when you go back half an hour later, if they've all left the bag, you know you never got the queen. Hmm. Okay, yeah. So you go back to them, you have another go. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So the great thing with the queen is, is she is the focus of the colony's life, but she doesn't control the colony. Yeah. So I just wanted to cover, if the colony find the queen is not laying very well, they'll produce a new queen. Mm -hmm. so how do they produce a new queen they have another gland that takes protein which is pollen and nectar which is carbohydrate so there's your two halves of your food cycle mm -hmm. and they will produce something you've heard of called royal jelly yeah very very high protein food mm -hmm. and if they feed an egg just with royal jelly it will become a queen. Hmm. <laughs> so the bees nursing the eggs decide if they want a new queen or not. So the, got fate, the fate of the colony lies not in the hands of the monarch, but in no. the hands of the populace. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, it's only a monarch because we call it a queen. That, you that's it. That's a it... complete misnomer is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, well, it's not a dictator, put it like that. It's yeah. quite the opposite. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. Okay. No, so, I've, have you read the Roald Dahl book, The Royal Jelly? Uh, I don't think so. It's about <laughs> a, a crazy beekeeper that, that uh, feeds his baby royal jelly um, <laughs> <laughs> to try and, um, I don't know, imbue some sort of stateliness into his, <laughs> into his progeny. But uh, yeah, it all goes wrong. It being Roald Dahl short stories were all very dark, as you can probably yeah. know. Um, <laughs> sorry, I interrupted you there. Crack on. <laughs> okay so so um let, getting pest controllers involved in in collecting swarms um so that fundamentally then it's the fact the queen gives off the pheromone and that's where the bees go now if it's a windy day it's possible for bees to get lost because mm. the the queen's gone they can't find the pheromone they'll just be flying around so when you collect a swarm quite often what i would normally do was i would have a box I drop the bees into the box, leave the box on the ground for a couple of hours. But if it's a nice sunny day, some of the bees will still be off flying. So when you remove the box, quite often there are bees left behind. And there's not a lot you can do about that. Right. Once they're in your box, how do you get them in a beehive? Right. This is so, the march of the bees that I've Yes, seen. have you seen that? It yes. is stunning. And basically, um, bees will focus on somewhere that's dark they don't like the light per se they obviously like the light when they go foraging but you get a white sheet and you lay it on the ground and you sit your beehive on the white sheet and you get your box and you empty the bees onto the white sheet and they will walk into the box <laughs> so you don't have to move the queen. The queen goes and goes herself. No, she's. You, you won't find the queen. There's five thousand, ten thousand bees there. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. So the white sheet is the whiteness that they don't like, mm -hmm. right? And the dark entrance to your hive is their place of refuge. 
Gotcha. Right. So this is what would happen if you deliver that box to a beekeeper. That's all they would do. Some people would try emptying them in the top of the hive. Hmm. But what the bees flying around haven't found the entrance. Putting the white sheet with the hive on, on it, the bees will find the entrance. And it's fascinating to watch them because you'll see them talking to each other and then a whole bunch of them marching off in the right direction. And then if you watch really carefully, when the queen finds out, you will see the queen running across the top of all of them to get in the hive. <laughs> I tell you what, it is, it is absolutely amazing to watch. So you've then got your colony in that hive, right? Okay. Yep. So, and all the equipment you, you would need as a pest controller, if you've got a ladder, you, you, and you've got your insurance, which you've obviously got, quite often hives are not just a conveniently a ground level. And most beekeeping associations don't insure beekeepers to collect above two meters. Ah, okay. You know, so immediately the pest controller has the advantage. Secondly, how many times are they wasps? In which case the beekeeper has wasted his time, but mm -hmm. it's an opportunity for a pest controller that they didn't know they had. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And then how many times is it Saturday afternoon when the pest control is busy out making money that the beekeeper collects? Yet during the week, the beekeepers at work and yet the pest controller is available. Yeah. Gotcha. So the pest control has far and away the best opportunity to develop a swarm collecting service. But what Steve Light at Shire Pest Solutions came across was the knock on effect of the software that we wrote on his website was at the end of July, he changed the name bees to wasps. Mm. And people reported wasps onto his website. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Right. So, uh, let's, let's go into the software then, because this is, this is a, a, a fairly tasty offering for the, the mm -hmm. pest control community. You've, you've developed a swarm notification piece of software. Do you want to go into yeah. it a bit? Yeah, sure. There's two parts to it. First is getting the notification in. And then the second is getting it delivered to the local pest controller or beekeeper or whoever. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a thing called an API, an application program interface. And it's a bit of computer code that sits on your website. And it basically you fill in, if I'm reporting a swarm, I'll fill in my name and address, and my contact details and upload a picture. That goes up into the cloud, into our Bee watch system and the system says ah oh, this postcode this swarm is at is near to martin cobbold so your phone will then buzz and it goes buzz 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 mm. <laughs> and up appears on your phone the contact details of the swarm being reported where the people reporting it a map of where it is and a picture of it mm. Right. You couldn't ask for much more, could you? The first uh, lead to go. Right, hold on. All within five seconds. Yeah. Right. Because remember I said earlier that the swarm comes out of the colony and hangs in the nearest tree. Mm -hmm. That's the time when you've got most chance of catching it. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's in the afternoon, they will stay there overnight because they're in a ball keeping the queen at 36 degrees. Mm -hmm. And in the morning when it starts to warm up, they'll be off. So if you ever get a call out at lunchtime, always ask the people to call you back later if it's still there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because it's this sort of time of year when it's warm and then it gets cool in the evenings. So the best time, if it's still there in the evening, great. If, it's, if they call you in the morning and it's cool still, great. But otherwise, you know, there's no point going out. It's likely to, to go somewhere else. Gotcha. Okay. Right. So the software, this API, um, it, we've got one on our website. And all you do is I could go on now and report a swarm in Suffolk and your app on your phone would buzz. So what that means is anybody can report a swarm anywhere with the API. And it's only the local person to that swarm whose app is activated with the information. Oh, so there's no duplication. There's no race to the swarm. Well, no, here's the point. No, no. It, but there may be two or three of you local, right? Right. Okay. So what the software then does, it it tells it tells you the details you need to know. It won't give you the contact details straight away because you don't mm -hmm. need to know those. 
That's what the swarm looks like. That's where it is. Do you want to collect it? So yeah. you then say on the app, I'm going to adopt this swarm. Two seconds later, I press, I'm going to adopt this swarm. And it says, sorry, somebody else has got it. Gotcha. Okay. Right. You then, your phone buzzes again. <laughs> oh, another one. I'll have that one as well. It won't let you go for a second swarm until you've told the system, were you successful with the previous one? Gotcha. That stops people scooping up everything that's going, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then you turn up on site and you collect the swarm happily and you go onto the app and you say successful. What the app will then do, it will display the name of a beekeeper that's requested a swarm. Okay, yeah. Okay. Good. It's clever stuff. I like it. Now, clearly the beekeeper needs to be registered on the system. And like all systems, you know, you don't get national coverage on day one. Mm -hmm. But as it develops in different areas, and around our area now, everybody knows, around our area, the pest controller gets the wasps and he gets the swarms. If we get a phone notification or we get one through the system, it's near us, we can go and get the swarms. So it's a case of everybody, and this is a real environmental benefit, is maximizing the opportunity of these swarms not just disappearing and dying out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and speed is the essence as i've explained so so that app at, at, at the um pest controllers end or the swarm collectors end that's the bee wash app basically and it's got a whole lot of other stuff about beekeeping but the only bit that, that a pest controller would use initially is to know where the swarms are and go collect them okay and the knock-on benefit of all this is something i mentioned right at the beginning which is data at the end of the year, the system will map out every swarm, where they were, where they collected successfully. And compared year on year, you start to get the big picture of the health of the insect environment out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you talk to government and I talk to the bee inspectors and everything, and they're just not in that level of forward thinking. Mm. You know, there's not that understanding of the value of what we call big data. You know, so mm. we have the system is fully integrated on the smartphone and everything. You don't need to make a single phone call and they're not interested. And in fact, my bee inspector, you're going to love this. He came and inspected last week and we've got 10 colonies now, which is comfortable for me to manage. He inspected all of them. He found Varroa in one of them. Not a lot, but they were still in there. And he wrote all his notes on a bit of paper. <laughs> and I'm scanning each hive with a QR code and putting the notes, the same notes into my app. Mm. You know? And you think, oh, okay. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Those millions invested into 101 may have been better spent yeah. <laughs> doing some mobile, mobile work in, software. Yeah. yeah, they're still investing in 101. They're just updating it. Yeah. You know, I was just, anyway. So yes, the whole... And, and the service potential, and I'm sure a lot of pest controllers know beekeepers, is the local association will have a training apiary and swarms are part of the seasonal activity. So to, to have a relationship with the local um, beekeepers association, such that when they've got wasps, you automatically get the call out. When you've got a swarm, you know somebody will take it. You know, um, Steve Light is paying, people are paying him to collect swarms. Mm. because they're in their garden or in their loft or wherever they are. Which, which are worth money. Well, here's the point. If you've got bees in your loft, yeah. um, I think Steve's minimum charge is £400. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's a case of going in there with your bee kit on and cutting everything out, putting it in a box. If you've got the queen in there somewhere, then the colony will reform wherever you take it. Mm. You know, it, it is, I dare I say it, pretty crude <laughs> mm. you know but not difficult the only time if you get swarms in a cavity wall something like that then you need to put what's called a bee escape on the outside of where they're getting in so the bees can get out but they can't get back in it's a yeah, very so simple bit of kit any beekeeper has like a one-way cat flap yeah it? absolutely for bees okay and once the, the foragers don't come back the bee the queen gives up in the end and she leaves right you know, there are chemicals now, things like Be Gone, which is a nasty smelling chemical 
that bees don't like. And if you pour it in their hive, they'll vacate it. But dare I say, it, diesel smoke is equally as good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, that's 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 pretty old school. We're getting more and more rudimentary <laughs> as time goes by. But it's a very very traditional sport, isn't it? Where yeah. you know tra traditional solutions are available. Um, uh, yeah, but you check check with your insurer first. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I mean, as far as the system is concerned, from our point of view, um, the the fundamental issue in this country of beekeeping is you don't have to be registered to be a beekeeper. So just about anybody, which is fine, can keep hives. But if you don't know what the diseases look like, you don't know if you're perpetuating diseases and so on. But there's no inclination at, at the national level to have any sort of registration. We're the only country in Europe that doesn't register beekeepers. What is the opportunity here, based on your research with agrochemicals, of getting... Um, bees considered as a bellwether species you know much like you you have uh, dragonflies or freshwater mussels mm. or something like that which is which gives you uh, um, a determining indicator of the overall health of the environment is is that something that is scientifically sound um all perfectly possible but the politics that the part of the problem with beekeeping is the average age of beekeepers i see okay you know they're my they're generation. old monks well, they're my generation and they think like 30, 40 years ago. So until okay. you get the next, you know, there's going to be this time lag, like the police with the adoption of the smartphone. You know, the smartphone. This is making around. me laugh, Norman. Sorry, I've got to, I've got to stop you. <laughs> this is making me laugh because you were there telling me what API stood for. And I thought it was a pun because Apis or whatever it is, is Latin for B. <laughs> So no, I'm sorry. I don't take your generational argument, but I understand where you're coming from with the um, with the well, technology. It's not the not the generation of beekeepers. It's the generation of the people that run beekeeping. Yeah. Okay. You know, and the influence that the agrochemical industry has over all of food production. You mm -hmm. know, and while bees are fundamental to it, um, they're also a problem. And you know, I mean, there are so many farming programs on the television. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's and they're very good programs about farming, but they complete create a completely um, obscure version of what farming is all about. They're all very nice and they're lovely people and everything, and they're doing a fantastic job. But there's lots of issues that don't get addressed, you know, mm. because they don't make good television and they don't make us feel good. So no, yeah. this is this this is making mm. me feel fairly deflated talking to you. Well. <laughs> But well, no, yeah, I, when, I'm with when, you. I'm only, I'm only teasing. But no, no, that's good. It's good, you know. <laughs> but, but I mean, we fortunately, you know, when you believe in something, and you know, we all believe in what we do. Otherwise, we go do something else. I would hope. Mm. Um, about uh, eighteen months ago, I was talking to Andrew in the office here, who, who's, um, normally um, running the beekeeping side of the business rather than the security side. And I said, right, you know, we need to get on some webinars and we need to find out what is happening out there with bees because we're getting nowhere with the, with the British Beekeepers Association in actually thinking this is worth doing. And we bumped into um, a webinar about international trade. Andrea popped up what we did. Two people came straight back and said, hey, we're looking for food traceability in Africa. Oh. Bingo. Food traceability in Africa. And it's like all things, you know, around the world are all these opportunities. And for two years, an organization called the Africa Honey Consortium, which is made up of lots of African countries where the primary rural industry is honey. When you go to places in the middle of nowhere where there aren't any roads, they're all producing mm. honey. Mm. It's a food source, obviously, but by the same token, it's part of their income. So we got this response. We've been looking for a system. We've looked to have one written. It's too expensive. Would your system do this? So we've now got a project that's nearly 18 months into delivering food traceability for honey out of Africa. Wow. When okay. was the last time you saw a jar of African honey on your... Never. Because Never, the EU, no. The yeah. EU won't allow it in because there's no traceability. Mm -hmm. Right. The Africa Honey Consortium already has offers of funding from 
three very small African countries that get a lot of funding from um, uh, UN and various other agencies. Kenya being one of the most stable countries is where these guys are based. Mm. Uganda, um, the Ivory Coast, now you're going to like this, the Ivory Coast, um, Mali, right? Christ, you're all over the place. Right. But they're French. Oh, yeah, right. Right. Our, soft, our B-Watch software is already available in English, French, Welsh, Swahili, because if you want to engage with people, you've got to do it in their language, right? So fundamentally to our development has been to make it available in any Latin character-based language. Mm -hmm. As soon as we showed the Kenyans it in Swahili, that was it, job done. So we're currently on a program um, to, to introduce traceability. We put QR codes on our hives when we we're monitoring our pesticide problems. So at uh, the end of next week in Africa, somebody will put one of our QR codes on the first beehive in Africa. And that QR code is read by the app when the bee inspector does an inspection. And that bee inspector is the start of traceability. Good Lord, I'm getting tingled. This is I genuine mean, serendipity. You are the only person uniquely positioned <laughs> with your background in software with your background yeah. in barcoding and with your background in beekeeping. Absolutely. You can mesh all of these things together to provide calorie dense nutrition in Africa and also a valuable export. Yeah. That's incredible. It's just, it's one of those things, right place, right time. Mm. You know, I could do it being 20 years younger, I must say, but there you go. <laughs> you can't, that's one thing we don't seem to have control over. Uh, but at the end of the day, you look at things and you go, hold on, what do we need to do just to make this work? And fortunately, we'd already had the language translation because we did be washing Welsh. Mm. And I went to the guys and said, listen, I want it in Swahili. And two days later, I had a draft version in Swahili because they just put it through Google Translate. Oh, right. Which is yeah. quite amusing when you come back with a literal translations versus, you know, what's yeah, the honey yeah. lion? Yeah. You know what the honey lion is? <laughs> Um, hang on a minute, honey. No, lion. sorry, the bee lion. The bee the, lion. What's the, the bee, bee lion? lion? Is that the hive? The beehive? No, no, it's the hornet. <laughs> so in it. Africa, the hornet is known as the bee lion. That's brilliant. You know? <laughs> so anyway, so this little project at the moment, I mean, on a daily basis, um, the other thing that we developed as part of our um, project to identify the pesticide issue was a new entrance for beehives. Mm. The, the entrance that was invented 175 years ago wasn't actually invented. What was invented was the removable frames from a beehive so you didn't have to destroy all the wax to get your honey out. And yeah. that was a massive invention by mm. a guy called Reverend Langstroth over in the United States. We'll come on to this, but what, what yeah. is the God connection to honey? Because I've always associated <laughs> it with, with medieval monks. I don't know why. <laughs> Well, the and now you've got a reverend is, making technological breakthroughs in Hive. Yeah. Well, you know, it was 1851 or whenever it was, I think that was the date, where he mm. patented this hive with a removable frame. And what he'd identified was there's a space between comb that bees operate in. And it's basically the space that two bees can pass in. Like and it's about space, yeah. three eighths of an inch, nine mm. mil, and it's called the bee space. Okay. And if they have a space bigger than that, they'll fill it with comb. And if they have a space smaller than that, they'll fill it with propolis, glue. Mm -hmm. And they do that around the hive to block up any holes that they don't want, or they propolize mice if they get in the hive or whatever. It's a glue that they use to, to, to stop things up. Mm. All right, all right, let me get rid of that. Right. Um, <laughs> sorry. And no worries. It, yeah. So when we looked at the entrance that came with the patent, basically what the guy did was he was in competition with some guys in Austria, I think, who were undoing the same sort of research. So he just took his whole hive and painted it. Mm -hmm. But the entrance was only there for convenience. It mm -hmm. wasn't something he'd studied. But the trouble was this patent came out of removable frames, which totally re revolutionized the harvesting of honey. 
So the rest of the world copied the whole patent, not just the removable frames. Gotcha. Okay. Right? And the fascinating thing is when you look at a beehive with a bottom entrance, it looks very much like a semi-detached two-story house. Hmm. And the question I always ask is, if you had wings, would you have your front door on the ground floor of your house <laughs> where right. all the local vagrants and the neighbours can all get in? Yeah. yeah. Of course you wouldn't. You'd have it up on the first floor, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. But we don't have bees. But bees do have wings. So why is the entrance at the bottom? And there is no logic to it whatsoever, unless you're a mouse that wants to get in, or a wasp. And this is, gets interesting. What we found by drilling holes in the beehive, it allows the bees to defend their colony through 360 degrees. Uh, okay. Right? Whereas if you've got the landing board in front of a normal beehive, you and the wasp are on the same plane. Yeah. So it's you versus the wasp. You've got a round entrance. It's you and your mates versus the wasps. And they're coming at him from 360 degrees. Mm. So what we discovered was wasps will not go in a beehive with a small round entrance. Okay. And wasps will wipe out your hive in the autumn. But there's some sort of predation that goes on there. They're after the honey, aren't they? They're after the honey. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and the, and the guard bees is uh, probably 15, 20 guard bees in a beehive, and job is to guard the entrances. Mm -hmm. But once those wasps have got through, then yep. forget it. That hive is finished. I see, because everything inside is... But all their buddies are there, and they're all... Defensive. Right, okay. see, absolutely. So we, we simply Im, Im, drilled holes in our boxes so we can shut them up quickly with bungs when there was pesticides being notified. Mm. And we found it's got all sorts of other benefits. And then when you research history, if you go back to 17th century beehives, they all had a little round hole. <laughs> <laughs> so what had happened, Langstroth's invention, it was so good as far as harvesting honey, people copied the whole thing, thinking that the entrance was actually fundamental to it. And it's oh, absolute yeah. nonsense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so we just shipped 1,200 of these entrances to Africa because they have the large hive beetle, and it can't get in this entrance. It can't fly, presumably. No, it's, no, it's too big. Got, got you. you see, the, the, the entrance on a, on a modern beehive is like 380 mil long and 15 mil high. Mm. Right? The entrance on our hive is a 25 mil circle. Got you. Diamond yeah. circle. Right? So you're selling so, the hives. You're not just selling the entrances. I was going to, going to say, how are you selling? Oh yeah, we're, you know, we're selling it as a kit. Okay. You get yeah. a little baffle that goes on the inside, which stops the wind blowing in. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. You get a ventilated plug and a solid plug that plugs up the holes. You get enough screws for four of these to cover four holes. Mm. You get a screwdriver and you get a 25 mil Forstner bit. Okay. Which means you can convert any hive that's got a single wall, a single yeah. walled hive. Yeah. But what they're doing in Africa, they're actually fitting them in brand new hives. So it's yeah. now known as the African Langstroth. It's oh, the Langstroth nice. removable frames, but with entrances that only let anything less than seven millimeters in. Mm. So the large hive beetle, which can destroy a colony, can't get in. Wow. <laughs> So this it's, 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 is absolutely it's, incredible. I don't know how many times my my, <laughs> my opinions have been reversed and my mind has been blown just in this conversation. But it's all um, come about because of us looking at pesticides. Yeah. The whole yeah. thing has come about because we were not happy about the reduction in swarms in our area and the losses through pesticides. Mm. You know, we haven't lost any colonies this year to insecticides like neonics. But, so, they're, but they're not used anymore. Or they well, use very, very, there, very there is still some legacy use, but no, technically they're not used anymore. Yeah. But, you know, we've, we've got pictures of dead bees writhing in front of a hive, you know, three inches deep. Mm -hmm. But they've come back from a field where they've got a dose of neonics and, you okay. know, just... The way to tell if a bee has been poisoned, yeah, it's proboscis will stick out Proboscis will stick out, really be extended. Mm -hmm. Proboscis. And that's, 
the, the, the rigidity that comes with a neurotoxin. Well, yeah, it's the tongue is fully extended. Okay. okay. But, you know, that's just, uh, that's part of on the app that we, we, we have developed specifically for the African beekeepers, for the bee inspectors, mm -hmm. because they don't have postcodes in Africa. Yeah. How do we know where the swarms are? How do we know where the apiaries are? So the bee inspector will visit your African apiary and from their app, they'll be able to record the GPS location. With a geocode, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the honey that they deliver will be to a converted shipping container called a honey processing hub. Mm -hmm. We need three and a half thousand beekeepers to supply one honey processing hub that will produce a thousand kilos of honey a day. A ton a day. A ton a day. A ton a day. Correct. And Kenya has the capacity for 50 of those, of those <laughs> mobile honey processing plants. Okay. So we, 50 we, tons a day, you reckon, that they could get yeah, export? That's the potential for Kenya, yeah. Yeah, that's extraordinary. So this, and each, this, uh, each hub will require four bee inspectors for the number of beekeepers, so that every apiary gets in, inspected once a month. Hmm. And what that does is then the bee inspector improves your ability to keep bees Therefore, the number of beekeepers needed to support a honey processing hub reduces. Mm. And we've worked out for the current population and density of beekeepers, the furthest any beekeeper would have to travel to get to market, which is what the hub is, is 17 kilometers. Mm. Right. When they turn up with their honey, it gets weighed in and they get paid instantly. So the system, the system will put into the local community about twenty thousand pounds a week in instant payment to beekeepers. Pounds through the honey processing plant. Christ alive! So this is you know, it's taking a rural. This rural industry is producing twenty five, thirty five thousand tons a year that dribbles into the marketplace. Mm. You're talking about taking a ton of honey a day, two or three hundred miles into Nairobi to a wholesaler. Mm. But the secret is you're paying people in their community. You're taking the market to the local community. Have you and had any means, political resistance to this, to any sort of centralised? Uh, no, uh, quite the opposite. Business. Quite really? the opposite. Yeah. Wow. Burundi is another one that's come back straight away and says we've got the money. You know, they're French as well. Yeah. I'm going to have to improve my French. Ghana, <laughs> Ghana, Uganda, Ethiopia, they're all part of the African Honey Consortium. Amazing. Yeah. And they're the guys on the ground. You know, I've said to them all along, we'll tell you what we do. You tell us what you want. It's no good. You know, we have this preconceived idea. We know what they need. No, we don't. The bees, the bee colonies are smaller because they don't have a winter. Mm. You know, it's it, beekeeping is totally different. Wow. So the experience that I have with trying to socialize any sort of food production or any sort of um, aggregation of commodities in Africa, because I, I, I do durables, I'm the, you know, I only, genuinely only deal in grain and maize and beans and that sort of thing. It, it comes, comes across an awful lot of political pressure of people who want to have government funded skimming off the top um, everybody deliver your stuff here. And when you start to uh, try and talk about getting community-led infrastructure programs, the political resistance is huge. Do you think that this is, we're, we're coming up against this, but you're not. It's because honey isn't internationally traded as a commodity. This is, this is something that isn't on markets, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think a there's trade, been lots trading of, markets. You're absolutely spot on. I think there's been lots of risk with honey coming out of China. Mm. This high is in pesticides. Antibiotics. Yeah, high in pesticides, high in antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So what did they do? They then shipped it through Vietnam and gave it a different name. <laughs> so, the, so the EU's rules and regulations then go through the roof, which means nobody else can get in. You know, mm. they can, but... Um, so yes, I think the politics are honey is high risk because of the nature of it. So it's a wild animal we can't control, yeah. basically. Um, but I think 
I think the key with the future of it is um, what you've got with COVID and, you know, every environment affects what's going on. What you've got with COVID is government's concern about the rural community moving into cities. Mm. Firstly, not only from COVID, also from climate change. The minute you, you move into a city, your carbon footprint goes through the roof. Yeah, okay. So part of the program that's part of our specification is a vocational qualification for beekeeping. Mm. Right. Probably, and this is only a guesstimate, 60 to 70% of all beekeepers in Kenya are female. Right. By nature of the culture, husband has several wives, you know, blah, blah, blah. The, the women has the kids, brings the kids up, and eventually, you know, the, the, the family is reformed, if I can put it like that. So what you've got is the women and the girls do the beekeeping as part of keeping the family going, right? So you're in a situation that this is an unpaid, unqualified job. So part of the program is if you want to bring honey to one of the honey processing hubs, you must already be a registered beekeeper with a vocational qualification level of three, which means you're not a beginner. You can recognize diseases and you are committed, if I can put it like that, not to be putting honey into the system that you know has a problem. Mm -hmm. We'll find out in the process of testing, but if you don't put it in at the start, it's a lot cheaper than trying mm. to test it later. Mm. Now that African vocational, African apiculture vocational qualification, the standards are being set at the moment. Then the system will automatically reject anybody that doesn't have that qualification on their ID when they turn up with their honey. Mm. It'll also reject anybody that's producing too much honey. If you've got four hives, don't come to us with 200 kilos of honey because it's not possible. Mm. So where did you get that honey from if you're turning up with more honey? So we can use technology to filter out a lot of the contaminants, you know, like um, they will overcook bananas, strain the juice and mix it with honey. And it looks like cloudy honey. Mm. Sounds quite tasty to me, actually. But, you know. <laughs> so the... The vocational qualification then means gender equality in the community. The child growing up has MBQ level four in beekeeping. She mm. becomes employable mm -hmm. as the industry grows. So I think what we're finding with government is they've been waiting for traceability to justify investing in the industry because of the export potential. And bear in mind, there's 15 times the amount of Manuka honey sold in the world every year than is produced. Mm. The African stingless bee produces medicinal honey. Okay. Much like Manuka. How, how sorry, we'll, we'll, we'll come back onto subjects here, but how can you sell 15 times more than you've produced? Sorry, say that again. You said there's 15 times oh, more yeah. Manuka honey sold than you, you, you mean it's, it's slightly um, fraudulent. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, New Zealand. Oh, yeah, New Zealand did some research on the amount of manuka honey being sold worldwide. It was fifteen times their production. Good lord! But it is. I tell you what. Uh, uh, have you ever tried it? Uh, yes. It tastes I, like German. It tastes like germline to me. To be honest, which is an old antiseptic. Oh, okay, right. But if I ever get, it, I've got a little tub of it that's one hundred percent that we bought when we were out in New Zealand. Mm. Right, I've still got the dregs of it. If I get a cut or a sore lip or anything, I put a dab on, on it and I tell you within a couple of hours, job done. But you probably don't know how it works. Do you know how it works? It's, it's a, yeah, <laughs> this is the old wives tale that if a cat gets in a fight, then you put honey on its ears. No, no, no I meant how does Manuka honey heal? How does it heal? Go on, hit me. It produces hydrogen peroxide. Oh, Okay, so which then gets rid of any sort of bacteria then? Absolutely. Is that right, okay. And the advantage of Manuka, natural honey, normal honey has a level of that, but the trouble is most manufacturers will heat the honey for 36 hours, I think it's 43 degrees, and then it stays runny for nine months. But they've killed off some of those benefits. Oh, okay. Gotcha. But Manuka has two levels of those benefits. 
Mm. So it's not affected by heat treat. Because okay. it has to be treated. Manuka honey is very gelatinous. So yeah. it has to be treated to be able to process it. That's a heat treat to be able to process it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but it produces hydrogen peroxide, which kills most things. <laughs> Incredible. So yeah, going back to the um the um African APRE vocational yeah. training. I've probably got that wrong. But no. um the how are you delivering the training? Because this this is, you know, it, it's quite nice that this is that's an old Ethiopian proverb, isn't it? If you teach the father, you teach the father. If you teach the mother, you teach the world. Yeah. And so the, the sort of um, gender equality in, in education that you're talking about, yeah, but it's not the same as in, let's say, a rural village school where, you know, possibly the women aren't allowed to go. Right. Especially in the northern parts of Africa. Another story. Um, how how is the, the training being delivered? Have you had any trouble with people um, struggling to read and write? Is it uh, right? Uh, okay, no, no, absolutely. I, I, I come back to something I said earlier. You can't underestimate how well educated these people are. Okay. Seriously, you know, I'm not saying you are, but it's just it's one of those things. The guys we're we're dealing with. Bear in mind, and you won't, you may not know this, but it, this is a, a unbelievable stat. Any idea the average age of a Kenyan? Um, I, see, I want <laughs> instantly. I wanted to say forty-three, but uh, yeah, but yeah, you should. The answer is no. Right. No, go on. No, twenty-one. Yeah. Okay. So the young population. Is what you're saying? Yeah. Basically, AIDS wiped out the middle generation. Jesus, really? Plus, you've got all the other African diseases. So the average age in Kenya is twenty-one. Wow. It is. I, I thought that would just be a you know a, a bottom-heavy generational no, thing no. but no that's li literally from so people who've died from life expectancy a, you've got a lot of young people with an appetite who had a tough upbringing mm -hmm. you know so this is why i always say to them, what do you want this is what we can give you is it what you want they come back oh you want this right great you will deliver that you know that's really the way to work now in these sorts of communities to get to get their acceptance but at the same time if they see it being delivered so to answer your question the thing about bringing the market into the rural community is it becomes a focal point for the rural community. Mm -hmm. Right. So a single model honey processing hub is basically a 20 foot shipping container with honey processing, storage, weighing, various bits of equipment in it. And they're about £75,000 a piece. Right. Put a 40 foot shipping container in and the other half is a training room. Because what you will have is people turning up and queuing for two or three hours to have their honey processed. And while they're there, you can be educating them and therefore it becomes a community focus. 10% of your output is wax. So you set up a little candle making business mm. and it starts to become a focal point with connection to markets all over the country. Mm. Because something turns up once a day and takes the honey away rather than travel for however many hours to a market and hope to sell some honey. And you think eventually there could be a, an international market for African honey as well? Because oh, of this that, is the, that is the fundamental aim of the project, is yeah. it, are the standards to export. How There's a lot of corruption, you know, mm -hmm. age-old thing in Africa, and, it, and it's when corruption is endemic, it's not a crime, is it? It's what everybody does. It's so culture, then. Yeah, yeah, we have to make the technology <clears throat> overcome the corruption. Mm -hmm. um, every container that the honey, the honey goes into the honey processing hub, goes through a filter and into a bucket. That bucket has an em embedded RFID device, something that identifies that bucket and it knows how much that bucket weighs. And you can't get it out. It's embedded in the, in the polyethylene bucket. So that sits on a weighing machine. And when your honey has been processed and it's in the bucket, the software, you record the weight. And then that bucket goes in the stack of buckets that are going off to the wholesaler. When it gets to the wholesaler, they put it on the same weighing machine. Mm. And it says, yep, yeah, this bucket still weighs the same. <laughs> so you got no skimming. Right. Yeah. Okay. Not unless it's very, very clever skimming. Mm. <laughs> Replacing volume weight for volume weight you know. oh, right, and yeah. they've got to know what the weight is so they'd have to measure how much they took out you know whatever mm. but at that point then 
you take samples from each of the 20 or 30 buckets that you've collected that day and you and the sample jar copies the RFID number across. You take half that sample and you mix it with all the others and you test for pesticides or, or contaminants. If you don't find any, fine. If you do find some, you go back and test each sample to find out where it came from. Mm. You have honey traceability. Full traceability. Because and, that, and that goes back to the hive as well because each of these people has to be registered beekeepers and you can't have the racketeers going around and picking it all up and bringing it all. Yeah, okay. The system okay. will not accept more than you can produce. Yeah. Right? Every hive's got a QR code on it. And it's all audited. Yeah. And gotcha. the bee inspector is recording that QR code every time he inspects. When you turn up with your honey, it's assumed it comes from one of your four, five, six, ten hives. Mm. Right? So we immediately, the system immediately says, this beekeeper, quarantine. Mm -hmm. No more, no more market for you. Yeah. Sorry, no, absolutely. sorry Sheila. Yeah. So, and, Jesus. and you take it to the guy next door and he says, don't give it to me. I've already had my quota for the month. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, so all of these little bits stop the rubbish getting in at the start, mm -hmm. but at the end, it gives that traceability. Now, That's it doesn't incredible. stop the guy in the laboratory falsifying the records, you know, <laughs> But, you know, somebody then comes down like a ton of bricks on them when it arrives in another country full of pesticides. So, you know, all you do is kill your whole market for yourself. Mm. So it's a really, and it all came out of just us putting QR codes on hives to simply know which hives died out when and what were found in that hives, you know. <laughs> Don't sell yourself sure because there's a certain amount of big brain involved there as well. When well, people we, we, say, you know, overnight success is, <laughs> they, they they usually take forty or fifty years to make. Yes, uh, uh, that's you know that that's that's the old saying, isn't it? Um, but it's no different, Martin. It's no different to putting a a barcode on a membership card in nineteen eighty three. Yeah, yeah. The, all the QR code is a glorified barcode. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll I'll tell you a story about um, underestimating people's education in rural Africa. I was in Rwanda in a place called Africa Improved Foods. And, um, and I sat down to teach a course on fumigation. And, um, and one or two people turned up before, I mean, I don't know why in Africa, people are early for everything or late for everything. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, no, no one's ever quite on time. Um, so, uh, and these guys have turned up really bright eyed, bushy tail, ready to go. So I chatted to this guy in the front called Justin, whose English was brilliant. And, yeah. um, and I said, oh, okay, so, um, so uh, where did you do your, um, where, did, where were you educated? And he said he, he did, um, he was, he had a master's in food science from Bruges University. <laughs> <laughs> Here no. I am, a country boy fumigator, yeah. <laughs> lecturing to somebody ridiculously over my head. <laughs> no, uh, in, the, in the middle of rural Africa, it was marvellous. It was a marvellous revelatory moment for this. No. So cool. Yeah, I mean, one of the guys, the guy that we were working with from the Africa Honey Consultant, there was another guy called Professor Rob Smurfit. Right. Who was a South African. Yes, you recognise the name, I bet. The name rings a bell, yeah, why? Yeah, Professor, he's done a TED lecture. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he can do everything you want. He's a guru on this, that and the other. And I started working with him on this project. Mm -hmm. Complete and utter waste of time. Really? all bullshit and I can do this. I know what I'm doing. We need to do this. We need to do that. Okay, but where's the money coming? Yeah, yeah, we can sort that later, you know. And then when it came to the crunch before we put a submission in for an innovate grant, it had to be on the Tuesday, he backed out on the Saturday. Mm. You know, but I'll tell you what, I, I said to Andrew in the office, I said, he's going to quit. He's one of these, you know, I'm not deriding the guy. He's very good at what he does. He's got, I think he's got a great reputation. He came up with the concept of putting bees into shipping containers. Mm. Bees, not honey. Okay. Because he has a system in Africa for growing snails in shipping containers. <laughs> well, it's that, sounds, that sounds deeply French, unpleasant as much as anything. Sorry, carry it. Plant, you know. Really? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So, so 
when I started working with them on the project, I said, well, that's brilliant. You know all about managing water, all about um, renewable energy, yeah, yeah, all that, all that <laughs> stuff. And then when it came to it, we couldn't actually find out where these things were. We couldn't actually get practical examples or pictures. And we just wonder if the whole thing was just a con, a good idea that, and then when he said, well, we could do the same with honey. And we started talking like we've been talking about honey. He realized he didn't know anything. Mm. And, and it's not, you know, there's a lot more to it, like all things than you think. But yes, he, he encouraged me, but all the time I had this, and he had this African idea, this South African pre-apartheid mentality of, now you have to tell them what to do, otherwise they won't do it. Jesus. You know, and, and, and I, th I thought at the time, I thought, ah, this isn't going to go anywhere. It's not a cultural but fit. Yeah. It dragged us far enough through the process to see that actually there was a different way of doing it. You know, but it's interesting yeah. what what you've um, said about being down in Africa. I was in Africa in 1967, mm. and it was exactly as we perceive it. A lot of people see it now. You know, mm. a broken Land Rover with a few whites driving around and a load of lackeys. You know, and that's <laughs> what it was like. You know, and they and and even even then, it's a long time ago. I was just out of school. Um, Nobody had the European name bit, mm. you know, whereas now every African has a European first name, you know, and, yeah. you know, and, and Makondawiri is his surname, Fred Makondawiri, you know, it's just the way it is now. But, yeah. Yeah. The, the guy who was my guide there was called Julius Caesar, which amused me no <laughs> end. <laughs> yeah. Julius. yeah, why not? Why yeah. not? And, and, and now you see the chain with, same with Chinese. We do work with the Chinese, you know, we get components from China. And you know it's Mary Wing, and I have one today, Billy Sheng, B I L I. Yeah. Oh, okay. You've kind of gone halfway house. I, I like sounds. that. I know yeah. how it sounds. I don't know how to spell it. You know. <laughs> cool. All right, Norman. We'll wrap Excellent. it up there. We went yeah. deep into that. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. And so, for the um. Uh, the educated pest controllers that wanted to expand their minds, they're, st they're still listening. Where do they find the Bee Watch software? Just go on to the Bee Watch website. That's bwe.watch, www.bwe.watch. Mm -hmm. Look for the API, and there's a registration document that's been updated. And just send us the registration document, and then we'll come back to you. There's a nominal cost just to install it. And then um, each year you renew the app. Mm. But the, I think the key with the whole thing is the more people are doing it locally, the more you interact with people. And it's that supplementary business you do apart from just the bees. And that's what Steve Light found. You know, his business has grown because everybody rings him now because he's the bee man, mm. you know. Sure. And it's that developing that I eco-friendly identity which you wish to be the pest industry in this country is very very uh, pesticide aware you mm. know and 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 is educated enough for people to say hey these guys know what they're talking about you know and yeah. that's that's really the key mm. Mm. amazing thank you so much norman guy but seems to be soon to be obe i've no doubt <laughs> <laughs> Over Good man. the extreme yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. It's absolutely brilliant. Cheers. Peace. Peace. Peace.